I bought a swanky New York City apartment and I regret it. I was single, I wanted to step up my game and this apartment had a sexy swimming pool on the roof. So as a 27 year old, I splurged and bought a 585 square foot mini one bedroom for $700,000. Seven years later, I sold the apartment for the same amount, $700,000 and swore off ever buying a home again. And it turns out this year, 17 years later, that apartment was sold for a million dollars, a paltry 2.7% rate of return, less than the rate of inflation. Is buying a home a bad idea? Absolutely not. But there's a checklist of variables to consider. In this video, I'll help you decide if buying a home is right for you. We'll cover the power of leverage, the trade-off of customization, liquidity, and forced savings, and the difference between consumption and investment. And in case you're wondering how many ladies I was able to impress with that swimming pool, the answer is zero. I met my wife the following week. Fun fact, I cannot afford to buy the home that I rent. Now we live walking distance from the beach in LA and our rent is $9,500 a month. And to buy this house would be somewhere between 3.5 million and $4 million. I could technically make that happen, but to service the mortgage, to service the property tax, to leave a buffer for maintenance, it would be a terrible financial decision. But I've already told you that I've been a renter for 13 years now. And those 13 years, most of them have been with me not working on Wall Street. We have always lived in apartments that we could not afford to buy. Is that irresponsible? Is that messed up? Is that burning money? It's not that simple right? Because as we'll talk about later, a big, big misunderstanding in this buy versus rent debate is the difference between consumption and investment. Is housing consumption or is it investment? And we're going to unpack that later. Let's first start with leverage and how powerful leverage is. And when I say leverage, that's a financial service term, but leverage basically means borrowing money borrowing money to buy stuff and technically borrowing money to buy stuff that goes up in value. So if you use your credit card to buy a Birkin bag, well, Birkin bags might go up in value. You use your credit card to buy a MacBook Pro. That's not leveraged, so to speak, because the thing that you bought doesn't go up in value. If you use money to buy an Acura, you borrow money to buy Acura, you're not buying an asset that appreciates. Cars don't appreciate. In fact, they depreciate the minute you drive off a lot. If you borrow money to buy a house, you're buying an asset that appreciates with borrowed money. So you're juicing up your returns. And we'll talk about, you can borrow money to buy stocks. You can borrow money to buy art. You can borrow money to buy collectibles. And this is actually, to a lot of laypersons, there's debt is bad, debt is bad, debt is bad. But that's a little bit of a misnomer, and, and we'll, we'll see how this contributes to the value in owning real estate and owning your house. Debt is good in a very specific situation. Debt is good when, again, you can borrow at a cheap rate and you can invest in an asset that grows at a higher rate than your debt. Let's just use a very simple example. Um, five years ago, you could borrow at a very cheap rate, like mortgages were three, four percent, and then your houses were going up five, 10, 15 percent, again, depending on the area. And so that difference, that's where the leverage kicks in, and it accrues to the person that took the debt, the person who bought the asset. Right. And the little known, known fact is wealthy people use debt all the time. They might borrow against uh, a painting that they have to buy a boat. They might borrow against private shares in the company that they founded to buy a house. And the reason why they do that is because as long as you can repay, you can pay your interest and the things that you own, the assets that you own appreciate, and these are both ifs, then you compound your wealth at a very, uh, very fast clip. And you avoid something else is you don't have to pay taxes, right? Let's use another example. Let's say that you bought a piece of art and it doubled in value. And then, now you want to buy a boat. And I would put a boat in a depreciating asset um, category. 
You want to buy the boat. You could sell the painting, but then you have to pay taxes on the gains and you don't, you no longer own the painting anymore. Or you could borrow maybe 20% of the value of the painting, take that cash and then buy the boat. Now you have to pay the interest. So you need cash flow coming in, but you also have the, you continue to have the value of the painting go up and you don't pay taxes because you sold it. Right. And so if you're able to cover, you know, what, what they call the, the debt service cost, basically, if you're able to cover the interest rates and your assets go up, it's phenomenal. Um, another interesting thing. So, so let's give an example of how, how debt can, can cut both ways. All right. This is a very simple example. You buy a home for a million dollars and you put 20% down. Okay. Let's just say immediately the next day you decide to sell and the price doesn't change the value. It's still a million dollars, but you pay 6% commission, right? How much did you lose on the money that you put in, right? You might be tempted to say you lose 6%. But no, the answer is you actually lose 30% because you didn't put in the first, the full million. You only put in 20% of the million. So your denominator is, um, is much smaller. And so your loss, the commission, the 6% is on the full million, right? So let me do that math for you. The commission to sell the house is a million times 6%, which is $60,000. You put in $200,000, the 20%. So you lose 60%, 60,000 over 200,000. You lose a lot of money. Now let's go the opposite way. Let's say that the next day the house goes up by 6%. Your the return on the amount that you put into the house, that's the leverage effect that you, your, your equity goes up by 30%. And so that's the, that's the leverage effect. And this is what private equity does, right? Private equity goes and finds these cash flowing businesses, waste management or healthcare business intelligence. These, these businesses that don't grow much, they still grow a little bit, but they spit off all this cash and they throw on a ton of debt. And just the, if the asset grows a little bit, they take all the cash, pay the interest, they make a ton of money because of that multiplicative uh, effect of leverage. So you could think of it, I, I like to think of this in nerdy finance speak of, this is one of the most powerful ways that an ordinary, unsophisticated investor can, can have access to a very powerful, very valuable form of debt which is the mortgage, right? And it's no surprise that um, on average, the, um, I think I had the number here, on average, I think 65% of uh, Americans' net worth is in their home because it's just that, that compounding effect is so powerful. And we've had low interest rates for a while and these home prices have gone up. Hey, quick time out. If you're watching this video, you're probably someone who thinks deeply and intentionally about your career, about your life, and about your relationships. But sometimes you might find yourself in a place feeling stuck, unmotivated, or just rudderless. If that's you, we have a coaching program for people looking to make a bold pivot and rediscover their aliveness. Just check out radreads.co slash coaching. Now back to the video. Now let's talk about taxes. There's also a tax benefit to borrowing money to buy assets, like getting a mortgage to buy a home. And the tax benefit here is that the U.S. tax code favors, um, is very favorable to having debt and different kinds of debt. You can actually deduct the interest that you pay from your taxes. This is crazy right now. You can't, if you bought, uh, your credit, your air, uh, MacBook air on, on your credit card, you can't deduct the interest there, but for host, for houses, for buying, um, companies, uh, when you borrow money to um, off of margin, off of your stock portfolio, which we'll talk about later, you are able to deduct that from your taxes. Now, the tax impact is mixed because in during the first Trump administration, he changed the rules. He capped the tax deductibility. And so that really made that tax deduction less valuable in high cost of living states, New York, California, tri-state area, which probably shafted some democratic uh, homeowners. 
Um, so that's something to keep in mind of how much can you deduct. The, the higher the home price, the less is deductible. So you lose that tax benefit. Another thing to think about, and this again varies per state, is the property taxes. And this kind of hurts on the other side, where if you have property taxes of one, one and a half percent, that property tax, as the value of your house goes up, your property tax goes up. And we'll come back to this saying, which is rent is the most you'll pay, mortgage is the less, the lower amount you'll ever pay, right? And so there's a lot of costs that can creep up in this homeowner uh, equation. You actually saw this in Austin. I have a bunch of friends that, that mentioned that they live in Austin and it boomed and their properties went up, which is amazing, but then their property taxes went up, which is a cash payment every year. So think about this, the, your home went up in value, good. Your property tax went up, so you have to pay more cash, very bad. And your job, like where are you getting the cash to pay that, that property tax? It's, it's, it's actually also one of the reasons why a lot of people downsize once they, they have kids is they think of their property taxes paying for the good school districts that they live in. <clears throat> All right, so to, in my case, I have, not owned a home since that, um, the sexy pool, pool, rooftop pool home. And I'm going to give the reasons why, and you can evaluate that for yourself, but it doesn't mean that I'm missing out on these gains, right? People are always like, you're crazy. You spend $9,500 a month on rent. That's fucking, I mean, that is crazy, especially because my income's not that high. However, um, here's the difference is that because I don't own a house. Let's say I would buy, let's say I would buy the house that I live in, three and a half million dollars. That's at least a seven hundred thousand dollar down payment, twenty percent. That seven hundred thousand is always invested in the stock market. So I have been fully invested in the stock market, somewhere between seventy and a hundred percent, my entire life, adult life, since I was for twenty seven years. I have been a highly, highly invested. So. Yes, all, I have missed out on these home prices going up, but guess what? The stock market's gone up probably more over that time period, and it's a much simpler investment. There's no maintenance. I push a button to buy or sell. So when people always say that there's an opportunity cost of the down payment, and if you are thinking about it in purely numeric economic terms, well, if you don't have to spend that down payment, um, don't go buy more toys, invest it. And that's how you capture that growth. But as someone who doesn't own a home, I still am really bummed that I don't have access to that leverage. I can't borrow to invest in an asset that appreciates because I can't get a mortgage. That's where another trick comes in. And again, this is not investment in investing advice. This is risky, but it's something I feel very comfortable doing is that I run margin. So I have this S&P 500 portfolio that has grown a lot over the past 27 years. It has all these embedded capital gains, kind of like the art example that I said at the beginning. And I want it to keep growing, but sometimes I need to access the cash, right? To pay my rent or to bridge something in my business or to make other investments. And I have borrowed money to make other investments because again, I think I can clear the interest Pay the interest cost with the returns of the thing that I would invest in. So to be very specific, I borrowed money against my portfolio. I paid the margin rate, which fluctuates. So it's quite high now at six and a half percent in, but I invested in bridge loans to high quality real estate. So these are very short loans, low LTV if you're a finance person. And the interest that I receive is more than the interest that I pay to borrow that money. So it's called a carry trade. I kind of capture that difference. And there's some upside on, on pricing warrants and things like that. So that is a risky strategy, but that it's to show you that even though I'm not, I'm not a homeowner, I would like to recreate some of the, the profile, the risk profile of a homeowner. And that is why I use a little bit of margin to just yeah, maybe have a little bit of FOMO there. And so again, I'm showing you both sides of the, the coin and how it's not this, this clear uh, black and white. All right. The next thing 
to consider about um, owning a home is that it promotes good behavior. And what do I mean by that? People will say, well, I like owning my house because it's forced savings, right? And what does that mean? It means you have a mortgage payment. Most mortgage payments have a principal component. So every payment, you're basically paying down your, your mortgage and you're you're making yourself you're, you're you're making yourself wealthier in the sense that you're key leveraging, you're not you're borrowing less money, right? So you're building that equity in your house. That's great. Uh, that's a very cool thing to be a force saver. But there's another way to be a force saver. You can automatically invest the same amount from your bank account into the S and P five hundred or whatever asset you want to every month. I've been a forced saver for 28 years. And in fact, I've some, some years I've saved a ton, some years I've saved less, but I've always been a forced saver. So you can recreate that behavior, but this is the nice thing is it, if you don't have that willpower to do it, then yeah, force save through, through a mortgage, force save through a 401k. But if you do, if you do have that temperament, then there's other ways to recreate that same goal. Right. And here's another thing about a house, which is the, the ability to see if it changes in value in real time. And that's called kind of price transparency in finance terms. So I'll give you an example. I had a friend that sold a company and it was a significant exit, eight figures. And intellectually, they knew that, you know, they're, they were... 30, 35 years old, they knew that the way you make that money grow is you invest in the stock market, it will go down, it will go up. And so they took the, the eight figures, let's say it's $20 million, and they bought stocks with their financial advisor. The next week, stocks went down by 10%. So 20, 10% of 20 million, they lost $2 million in a week. The person couldn't sleep, taking sleeping pills, calling her broker all the time. And ultimately their, their life was miserable, even though intellectually they knew it would rebound. Guess what? It rebounded in spades, but they sold after the 10% loss. And they said, you know what? I'm going to put in real estate. I don't want to see the price every day. Now, the funny thing is if the stock market goes down 20%, real estate prices probably went down some similar amount or they went down for sure. You just don't know it. You can't see it. You can't track it on your phone. You can't get alerts. You can't build a calculator that updates you. I mean, you can see the Zillow, the, what is it? The Zestimate. Um, and so again, this is another example of owning a home kind of force, enforces the behavior, which are, these are all like good nudges. If you don't have the discipline to not sell when things go down 10%, but if you do, then why you don't need a house to recreate that behavior, which is what some people think. All right. So I talked a little bit about the financial piece of owning. Let's talk about what I really, really love as someone who loves to philosophize on life and on decision making. I think the beautiful thing about Owning a home is that it forces you to truly understand what matters to you. And then you have to do that with your partner. That is a stretch for a lot of people. It is hard to, un it is very hard to understand your own preferences. Many grown people, grown ups, struggle with that. So let's look at the first preference, which I'll call liquidity or mobility. Right? Liquidity or mobility is. It's much easier to get out of a housing situation if you're a renter than if you're a buyer, owner, right? If I rent, I rent, most houses have a one month security deposit. Let's say the house gets infested with bed bugs, right? Beyond repair and the owner, the landlord's being irresponsible. Yes, you can sue them and take them to small claims court and all that. You could also just piece the fuck out. And if you piece the fuck out, you lose one month, two months of down payment. Now, if your house, if you're a homeowner and your house becomes infested with bed bugs, 
you can't peace out on your house. You gotta, you gotta do the whole kitten caboodle, right? I remember we looked at a house and it was a little bit above our budget rental. And it was a wonderful house. And then we found out a year later that the house to the left and the house to the right were teardowns and they were just constant construction for two straight years. It is very possible that we would have just walked on our, on our security deposit if we had lived in a house. Living amidst two teardowns is my worst nightmare. And that's the, the flexibility that you get if you are a renter, right? Now that flexibility comes at a cost, right? And there are two major costs that people associate with renting. One is that you can't predict the rent increases, which is spot on. And they can be terrifying in these high cost of living cities. And then the second is that they might just choose to not renew your, your lease, right? Usually because they sell or they move back into the house. And if you're raising kids, if you like your neighbors, if you've invested this time in your community, your habits, your, your highly localized preferences, that effing blows, right? And so there's the trade-off right there. How much, do you, how much do you value mobility? Do you value the ability to say, hey, I just got laid off, let's downsize. We just had another kid and we got a dog, let's upsize. Or do you wanna know that your, your full cocoon is very stable, right? And there's no right or wrong answer, but that is a consideration that needs to take place. Because of the liquidity thing, you can't just change your mind and sell your house. That becomes quite hard and quite expensive. And you have to stage the house and you can't, you know, you have tenants, um, prospects coming in and out, right? So one of the rule of thumbs, and I think this changes based on interest rates and home prices, but the rule of thumb that I use is if, if I wanted to live in a place for seven years, it might be, make sense to kind of incur that, mo that, the, that friction. Right. And, and to be fair, I've, I will have lived in two rentals for seven, seven years, but as an entrepreneur, I really value the ability to be like, no, nope, we're out. We're, we're done with this. We had a bad two years. Let's downsize. We had an amazing two years. Let's upsize. Right. I really value that. And the cost of the, the fear of them. Yes. The fear of raising rent every two years, because we signed two year leases is terrifying. And I also know that if they're raising my rent significantly, all of my financial assets probably did pretty damn well. Right. They're not raising my rent in a recession. They're not raising my rent in a down market. So, but again, the question becomes, how do you manage your psychology? All right. The next preference, customization, right? One of the downsides of being a renter is that you can't customize your place. I want to build an amazing YouTube studio, but instead I got cables and this makeshift rickshaw of a setup um, because it's not worth the investment of customizing shelves and so on. Um, I would love to have a cold plunge or a sauna or a lot of kind of wellness things, meditation room in my house, not possible because we are going to move at some point. And why would you invest that cash? Likewise, as I've gotten older too, I've realized that I love being at home. I really, I like being at home more than I like traveling that flip right in my late thirties. And since you, if you like being at home, I like make home the place you love to be in, right? And the finishes and all that. So there is a trade-off there in the level of customization. And again, I'm going to show how it can slice both ways. One of the biggest challenges with customizations is that there's, first of all, there's an endless menu of things you can customize in your house. Power blinds, in-house stereo, um, like I said, all the wellness things. And your house can quickly turn into a money pit because there's no constraint, right? You're like, oh, well, I'm going to live here forever, right? I'll put in a fire pit. I'll put in a sauna. That's one. Uh, the second is you add complexity to it, which we'll, we'll talk about later, but more things can break, the more things you can customize. And then let's talk about home improvements, right? Because I think uh, a lot of people think that, well, I'm going to get this money back. I put in this fire pit. I'm, I'm getting it packed. It's like, guess what, bro? A lot of people don't care about fire pits, right? I was looking up some of the research on renovations that have a positive return on investment. And y'all know that the two mainstays are um, kitchens and bathrooms, right? Decks 
potentially, things that expand the square footage, potentially, but not always, um, especially because it, it's probably because it's not like bedroom space, it's more communal space. So expanding and then pools is anywhere from, from flat to you recoup half of your investment. So a lot of the home improvements um, are, are dicey at best from an investment perspective. Now they make your place baller as fuck. So they're amazing. But again, talking about preferences here, don't, don't try to trick yourself into believing that this pool that you want to put in is going to be, you're going to get a return on that investment. No, that is consumption. Like you, you want to enjoy that pool while your kids are young. All right. Let's get to my next preference. Simplicity. Do you want simplicity? So we've already, this is kind of baked into mobility and customization, but let's make it explicit. The simplicity of renting is if something goes wrong, you make a phone call and they fix it. If you get into a fight with your landlord, you threaten to leave or you have, you have options. There is a real simplicity in that it's not your problem. It's temporarily your problem, but once it's in the hands of your landlord, it's their problem. Now, again, this will lead to some gray area where they're like, well, that's, a nice to have versus a need to have. But in general, there is tremendous peace of mind in the simplicity of just making a phone call. And I know from friends who are homeowners, it's every two months, there's something. Every two, broken laundry machine, roof, leaky roof, um, AC, HVAC issue, um, mold, right? It's just every couple of months, broken dishwasher, right? And these, these things add up. They're called phantom costs. They add up both in the actual cost, but they also add up in the mental space of just constantly having to deal with this, right? And this is one of uh, our favorite reasons for renting is just the simplicity of you pick up the phone and you call someone. The other element of renting is, I would say it's less the simplicity, but it's the constraint is that because you know it's not yours, you're less motivated to customize it. And customization ha re requires, men I, you all know what it's like to deal with contractors. It's mind space and it's a money pit for you, right? So it's a, so that is, again, a trade-off of simplicity. Renters have simplicity. Owners have complexity. Again, you can slice it and dice it. Uh, different ways. And again, I go back and rent is the most that you'll pay. And then the mortgage is the least that you'll pay. The last one is last preference is commitment, right? You've heard of relationships where the couple isn't doing well and they say, well, let's have a baby and it will, it will make our, it will make us stronger, right? I have heard many people make the argument that buying a home forces you to plant roots. Maybe you become less of a grown up Peter Pan. You commit to something. You commit to an area, you commit to a school district, right? And then you plant that stake in the ground and you grow, you build a family around that. I have, I have no critique of that. But I also want to point out that you can plant a stake in things without physically planting a stake in things right? We are committed to the area that we live in. We might move houses here and there. So yes, we'll have new neighbors, but nothing is so permanent. That's my opinion. It's like things that like, even if you move, you own a house, you're like, oh, we love our neighbors. Your neighbors can move. Even if you plan on staying there forever, your, your neighbors might move, right? So the permanence that comes with a commitment is tenuous at best. And if you're over indexing, then you got to be careful. Lastly, there is a difference between consumption and investment. Now, real estate has done so well over the past decades that everything gets turned into an investment. But let's think about this. Let's slow down. If you were going to make a real estate investment, wouldn't you scan all of the possibilities be like, yes, this area outside of Fisher, Indiana is so under the radar there. Amazon is building an, uh, an HQ there. 
the school systems have just pivoted. Um, you know, there's a, a new sports team is coming to, you know, downtown Indianapolis. That's the play. That's where you go make an investment where you see something, a potential that's untapped. That's usually not how buying a house works. When you buy a house, you say, this place has good schools. It's safe. I like the downtown area and um, the playgrounds are clean, right? Well, guess what? Usually when those things happen, that's the market's pretty priced in, right? And so I think what happens is people tend to delude themselves and they're like, this is going to be an investment where there's an element of it that's consumption, right? You don't buy a car and say, this is an investment. It's consumption. Like you spend money for a service that a car brings you, which is transportation. Now, I believe that most people buy houses for consumption. They say there's a service that the house is going to provide me. It's going to provide me shelter. It's going to provide me community. It's going to give me access to schools. It's going to provide me proximity to my office. That's, those are consumption reasons. I don't think people are looking around LA being like, oh, I'm going to buy this house in Manhattan Beach because it's going to go up a lot in the next decade. It has, but like we said in the New York City example, that's not always the case. And by the way, there's a lot of costs along the way. And so that's the ultimate, ultimate preference indicator, right? And I think people confuse them. So really, if you're looking at this decision, this big decision, you're going to put 20% down, really consider, is this consumption or is this investment? And from that one question, many of the factors, these preferences will kind of fall into place. And I'm rooting that you make the perfect decision.